So, so as we're all starting to get settled in, I'll, I'll um, introduce myself, provide a little bit more background on the topic. Um, so as uh, Mayor Goldsmith mentioned, I'm the Chief Innovation and Collaboration Officer for the Purdue Research Foundation. Uh, if you ask me, what does that mean? Uh, I really couldn't tell you, except uh, I get to think and work with great people who are thinking about problems of the future and try to figure out how Purdue might be able to help them uh, solve those problems. So it's a fantastic job. I think probably next to President Daniel's job, I have the best job uh, at Purdue uh, because of all that interaction and collaboration that, that goes on. Um, I'd like to welcome you all. Um, to uh, the Discovery Park District, and in particular to the Convergence Center here. Uh, this has been a dream in the making for probably the last two and a half, three years. This building technically opened in March of 2020, and I think everybody knows what happened in March of 2020. So it's probably the worst time you could be opening uh, an office building. Uh, but now with the pandemic being more endemic, and putting everything uh, behind us and uh, you know, taking the lessons learned forward. It's great to see all this interaction and this is what we always imagined. Um, we're really trying to develop the Convergence Center as the business front door to Purdue University. Um, we like to tell the story that you know, if you're here for a football game, you know where to go. If you're here for a basketball game, you know where to go. If you're a senior in high school for the campus tour, you know where to go. But if you're a company, one of these people that you know, their day job is, is thinking about the future and thinking about innovation and places and people to work with, um, where do you go? Um, and you know, Purdue's very fortunate that we've got over 50,000 students and 2,000 faculty and we're leading uh, you know, school, particularly on the engineering side. Um, but that's, that's a hard place to navigate. Uh, and so the Convergence Center, you're, you're in the business front door, sort of the commercial front door to Purdue. So I'd like to welcome you all here today. So um, one of the things uh, about my job, as I mentioned, I get to work with a lot of smart people um, and uh, try to think about what the future could look like and how to leverage relationships uh, uh, in that context back to Purdue and collaboration. Um, and so you're also standing not just in there, sitting in the Convergence Center, but you're on the corner of about 400 acres of future development that, that's, that's coming out of the ground now. Places are open. Um, if you could pull up the first map, uh, I have one slide I, I want to orient you. Um, so this is a map of the district. So all of the area that's colored in gold and green and blue represents that 400 acres that I talked about. And um, all of this is being uh, managed through the Purdue Research Foundation. Uh, the Purdue Research Foundation is one of the you know, few groups that's re primarily responsible for real estate development uh, on behalf of the university. And this 400 acres over a series of time and through some major infrastructure projects that have occurred, we basically accumulated these 400 acres for private development. And over the next 10 years, uh, this 400 acres is going to see over a billion dollars worth of investment. Um, it's going to see probably the addition of another seven to 8,000 people. Uh, these are people that live here, they're people that work here, they're people that visit here. Um, and it's all under the governance uh, of Purdue Research Foundation. So we have very tight working relationships with both the mayor of West Lafayette as well as the mayor of Lafayette. Um, but more or less, this is a, a very unique sort of municipality. I'll, I'll say that with a small M, not a big M, but this is almost its own municipality. So as we started to think about all that great development and mixed use development, everything from manufacturing to research to residential to multifamily homes to, we made a recent announcement the last couple of weeks about Ascension Health, uh, building a small health clinic up here you can kind of get the sense that when we looked at it about three or four years ago, we said, you know, this might not be quote unquote a smart city. And that was the, and that's the language that obviously has been used. And I, and I actually don't like the, the um, language of smart city so much as connected community. Uh, but when we saw this, we said, you know, wait a second, what's held some of these places back uh, from being really the places that everybody imagined? Uh, and there were two or three things, and, and we've tried to apply the lessons learned to how we now think about this development going forward. One is most of these take place in an urban area, a uh, million plus people. 
Uh, very hard to get anything done in that kind of environment. I mean, Mayor Goldsmith went from Indianapolis to New York City. Uh, traffic is a huge problem uh, uh, in a place like New York City because they got lots of people that have to get to work every day. Uh, smaller places don't obviously have that, that kind of problem. Uh, so people was one thing. Uh, legacy infrastructure was another. You know, we believe technology, uh, it was talked about in the previous panel, you know, we believe that that's uh, you know, fundamental utility, just like water and electricity. So we've spent a lot of time developing the technology platform uh, for the district. Um, we've had a lot of companies come here, ATs and Ts and the Verizon, and they've all said, well, we'll invest in your fiber, we'll invest in this, we'll invest in that. And we basically said, no, we'll find the money, we'll find the partners. We want to create a neutral technology platform that essentially is a level playing field that provides that kind of service and connectivity to everybody who lives, works, and plays here. And if we do it right, innovators in this space will come and they'll figure out how to take advantage of that basic infrastructure to advance innovation going forward. So that, that was a very important element to this. And then the third thing, as I've alluded to it, is uh, this is all governed by a single governing uh, entity called, you know, called the Purdue Research Foundation, working very, very closely with the cities and with Purdue University. So those three things, I think, make uh, this district very, very unique. And so in addition to it being a great place to live, work, and play, what we've, and you've heard it mentioned here a couple times, is we've coined the phrase lab to life platform. So LT, uh, L2L stands for lab to life. And what we believe is there's very few places in the country where you can come in an environment like this that, okay, doesn't have a million people, but it's got seven to eight, 10,000 10, people doesn't have uh, maybe you know, a purely AT&T infrastructure, but it's got a neutral host infrastructure that you can plug and play a lot of different technologies on top of. And if you wanna try an experiment and go from, we like to talk a lot about going from zero to one to 10, idea being zero, one to being proof of idea, 10 to being some sort of traction uh, in the community based on our scale and what we think the impact of that could be. Uh, and then once that gets established, uh, people can take that out and you know, figure out how to take that to 100 to 10,000 to a million. Uh, so it's really about how do we rapidly advance innovation in this connected space. Um, and you know, let's face it, our, our economy is fundamentally changing. Uh, you know, one of the things uh, I like to reflect upon because of all my you know, degrees and, and the ways I think about things, but you know, we were really probably in the, you know, the, the, the beginning, even though it might not seem like the beginning, but we truly are in the beginning of the digital age. You know, we went from the agrarian economy about 150 years ago to the industrial economy to now the digital economy. And if you think we're connected now, <laughs> you ain't seen nothing. Um, the future is going to be, um, you know, a hundred times, a thousand times, orders of magnitude more connected. And so where do you go to evaluate those things? And not just for technology's sake. I think what you'll hear from, from my colleagues here on the panel as we talk about innovation and the places you go to sort of test these things is the technology sometimes is the easiest part of the solution. The question is, what's the business model that's going to sustain that technology? Who's going to invest in it? How do you monetize it? How do you engage with the community and the people that live there to figure out you know, what problems you want to solve? Again, this is not technology for technology's sake. It's really about technology affecting um, the, uh, the quality of life and the impact for the community here. And being on the campus of Purdue University, which is all that gray area around the colored area up there, you know, with 50,000 of, of the world's smartest kids and, and faculty members all interested in these topics, it really is a, a, a great playground. So now you know why I get excited about coming to work every day, uh, is the opportunity to, to think about these things. So, so with that introduction, what I'd like to do is um, I'll briefly introduce my panel mates. Um, we've got Scott and uh, Karen. Uh, Scott's from Saab. Karen's from Ericsson. Uh, we've got Lee Hamilton from Cisco. Um, his CEO couldn't be here today because he's in Davos. Uh, and when Mung, when Mung actually talked about having an event here, he said, let's make it a Davos-like environment. I'm like, 
okay, the Alps, uh, and, but, and I didn't realize that Davos was actually going to occur this week, right? But I heard your CEO on Spock Box this morning uh, talking from Davos. Uh, and then we have uh, Lee um, uh, Davenport from US Ignite, who's going to talk a lot about community engagement. They're, they're a think tank out of Washington, D.C., focused on smart city initiatives and things like that. So what I'll do is uh, we'll go... Uh, from left to right, I guess. Uh, so Scott and Karen will talk a, a little bit about, maybe you could introduce yourself, talk a little bit about your company for those that don't know, um, you know, about Saab or about Ericsson, uh, et cetera. Um, and maybe begin by just talking about what's exciting about what's going on in the Discovery Park District and the opportunity to advance innovation and why, you know, why you're here, more or less. Okay, so I guess it's me. Hi, I'm Scott Remillard, I'm with Saab, obviously representing all things Swedish, as you can tell here. Um, so you may think of Saab from the cars. Uh, actually, Saab is a global aerospace company, defense manufacturer, obviously in Sweden. Uh, but we do have a, a, a group of us that do air traffic management here in, uh, in the States, in, in Syracuse, New York. I've been a business development manager since uh, 1999 there, so over 23 years, 22, 23 years there. And the problem I've been asked to solve is when I started, it was novel that you could track aircraft on a surface of an airport. And the purpose of my job, the last my career has been, is trying to find the business prop proposition with that. You know, trying to find the alignment of who pays, who benefits, and how can that business model be solved. Um, and, and now the, the work we're doing here at Purdue is uh, we're providing some uh, capabilities to the research center. And, and really the open question is, how can, with the burgeoning connectivity and way to share data, how can we make aviation, and that's the focus of me is aviation, how can we make aviation more deterministic versus probabilistic? You know, typically uh, air, air traffic is just a series of calcified pipes, stove pipes of information, you know, structured handoffs between different entities that all are probabilistic. We have schedules and sometimes they're early, sometimes they're late, and we build our resource planning around that. But the reality is, is high, there are very powerful ways to make this deterministic. And I think there is, you know, just think about all of us, you know, how many times, you know, show of hands, who sat in an air, airplane in a queue waiting for a gate? Or how many times have you uh, sat in the fetal position at a dash eight next to somebody like me waiting to take off? You know, uncomfortable, right? Um, it's, there's unpleasant, right? It's, there's a lot of waste. And you know, what if we as a community could, could eliminate 30%, 10% of that waste? What is that value proposition? That's tremendous. And so this is the, the crux of what we're hoping to accomplish here. Thanks, Scott. Karen, do you want to introduce yourself and a little bit about Ericsson and, and kind of why you're here? So I'm the other half of the Swedish representative here. Yeah. <laughs> hey, can you hold your mic up? Do you, do you hear me there better you now? Yeah. So I'm the other Swedish half. <laughs> uh, both Saab and Ericsson are Swedish companies. Both of us are not Swedish. Uh, so I will not ask who thought of Sony Ericsson when I said the word Ericsson, because that will implement your age. But Ericsson is not creating phones, not mobile phones. What we do is 5G or LTE, the 4G version of the communication, of the cellular communication. We are the suppliers, one of them, of the Verizons, AT&Ts, and T-Mobiles of the world. They own the spectrum of radio, and we are creating the hardware and the software for them to give us, the consumers, the cellular connectivity. Uh, one of the, right, the Gs, the generations of the cellular, represent how strong the connectivity is, okay? When, the G is higher, the, the connectivity becomes stronger and better. Right now, we are talking about such strong and reliable network that it will not impact us as consumers. It will impact what can be done in, in industries, in huge masses of data, and everything you heard here with the smart cities uh, mayor's uh, discussions. Having, having now big industries as our customer, we also have a product which is a private network, which is exactly the same product that we sell for the AT&Ts, but just small, in a box, and allows venues to have a private local network. 
The value of that is that you control what is using your data. You, you control what is using your traffic and as such, the utilization, okay, of the prioritization of the, of the power. Why am I saying that? Because my role in Ericsson is business development of that product. And in order to explain to cities or industries or faculties why private network is important, I can speak forever about reliability of network, which means nothing, or collaborate with companies that are using cellular for industrial solution and showing how those solutions becoming better when they are using cellular and as such the infrastructure that we enable is important for the end customer. So my role is to partner with companies like Saab <coughs> that present the value of our solutions okay, as a business developer. Now, I'm often asked, we are all often asked, what is Ericsson's solution for manufacturers versus for smart cities? And the answer is the same thing, exactly the same thing. It can be for wider area or for smaller area, it's exactly the same solution because it's the same solution that all of us use in their phone for connectivity, okay? So how does it differ? It differs in the way that the industry knows how to utilize that. And then if we are looking, our view now, my view, the edges of the utilization of the readiness of the industry to use the, the infrastructure that is already there, existing, okay? We see in one edge, we see factories, we see mines, we see private entities that has a PNL. They have value, financial value that they can gain from being more digital, from being more autonomous, from using all that data that somebody here mentioned that already exists, and the softwares that already exist and know how to create results of that data to make better, either, either better revenue or just efficiency and save money. Okay, so fac manufacturers, factories, mines, they are the faster to adapt. And as such, the companies that are building their ecosystem, their solution, are faster to create solutions. On the other end, we can see the cities, and it was discussed here, who is responsible, who owns the PNL, who invests. Like we, we, were, we heard here about the ideas of how to get data of traffic. All the cars are connected, okay? 50% of the car being produced has computer in the car, and the other 50 has a driver with a cellular phone. Waze already know what the traffic information uh, st status is. Cities can use that. All the data that we heard that exists in the, in the lights can be used to prevent accidents. But somebody has to have the motivation to make solutions happen, and there is a lot of governance and responsibility issues at that, at the governmental area, okay? In the middle of that range, we see places like airports or seaports where you do have a management, you have a lot of tenants. Until now, usually each tenant operates by separately from, from the group. But if the management knows how to utilize the data and give services to all the, all the tenants, the tenants gain profitability and revenue, the management gain profitability and revenue, and to, I arrived from uh, Dallas to Indianapolis yesterday at 1.30, I think, 1.30 a.m. My suitcase arrived at 2.15 a.m. There's no need for that. We have, you saw the robot here? We have autonomous ro uh, forklifts, okay? All the suitcases are already in the, American Airlines told me where my suitcase is. <laughs> we know where it is, okay? It could have been there in 10 minutes. It could have been there before me. It is, and, and the Indianapolis airport is very impressive. Everything is autonomous and ecosystem, and like they have these cellular fields. It is amazing. Somebody just has to 
implement the solution. So what we would like to do here, and we are now exploring that uh, with Purdue and Saab, is to enable the, the infrastructure at the airport that Saab have, together uh, at the airport that Purdue have, together with Saab, in order to create solution, both with Saab and with other partners of Purdue University, to just to encourage the ecosystem to use uh, the, the infrastructure and for us to be very much more comfortable in, in when we fly around. Thank, thanks, Karen. So one of the things we'll come back and touch upon is this notion of we're, we're, we're also planning to bring the airport onto our platform. So in addition to the 400 acres that I mentioned, we're talking about how we might also incorporate the Purdue Airport uh, into the platform as well. Uh, if we did that, we're talking now over a thousand acres. Uh, and when you think of now having an asset like an airport, uh, on a platform like that, it really does open the mind to other kinds of innovation and opportunities. Um, few people know, but Purdue has the second busiest airport in the state of Indiana, next to uh, the Indianapolis airport. And it's not busy necessarily because of all the commercial airlines that come in here, but because of all the pilots that are trained here at Purdue University. And it's not just pilots. Uh, you know, we have a top uh, aviation, you know, uh, aviation engineering, so we got rocket scientists and people that do that, but then in the aviation program as well, it's not just about pilots, it's about, you know, the future airport managers and operations folks. Uh, it's about all the people that are going to be thinking about some of those other logistics. So when we think about mobility uh, going forward, we don't think about it just in two dimensions, like you know, on, on Mother Earth, uh, we think of it in three dimensions. And when you start thinking about mobility in three dimensions, it's not just about controlled airspace like at an airport, it's under the governance of the FAA, but how are we going to do, you know, air delivery of things? We've got robotic delivery of things uh, that you saw coming here. Uh, so 3D mobility, and, and we're very impressed with some of the systems, both from what Ericsson can provide on private network side, as well as uh, what Saab can bring to the table in terms of what Scott mentioned, you know, how do you track critical assets on the ground uh, and make them work together without them all just being sort of silos in, in and of themselves. So it's really about how can you create an equality of life, a quality of experience for the people here that, that really, you know, tap into that technology. So, so we'll, we'll come back to that. Lee, why are you here? Yeah, thanks, uh, David. Um, so USA Night's a bit different um, than the billion dollar organizations here. Um, we are a small nonprofit. Uh, we're a, a think tank based on the idea that um, there are a group of people who can be project agnostic, but technology biased. And that that group of people, uh, we work to support and accelerate successful Smart city projects, right? If you will, um, our projects include a $100 million test bed for advanced wireless research uh, with National Science Foundation support. Uh, we are in partnership with the Department of Defense to deploy technologies and networks, uh, drones, and advanced um, artificial intelligence on um, several bases. And in the division where I work, uh, division, if that's a thing, uh, in the end of the organization where I work, we support municipalities as they work to understand the needs that their residents and visitors face, and then leverage their relationships with the private sector, with universities, with infrastructure partners and startup organizations to create uh, successful environments for projects to exist, demonstrations, pilots to exist. We know from our research that uh, around one third of smart city projects will fail, and about 80% of projects will fail to scale, right? And so of those that even make it out of prototype, only one in five will have a chance to ever see kind of daylight. And this is not our research, this is well done. Uh, we support the idea that in partnership, when we put the people at the middle of that organization, those that can make decisions, identify the solutions that are necessary, um, match the opportunity with technology to the opportunity that's, the challenge that's stated by the community it's to serve, whether they're, uh, residents of a community, temporary or permanent, um, working or living on a military base or in a state or sub-community, uh, that, that week when we can work with those partnerships, build bridge and relationships, then we're most likely to find success in that. And so we're gonna talk a little about what we think is important too, and that is the basis of that is a 
of civic trust, fostering the belief the, the people have in the leaders that have, they have been chosen or elected to represent them. Thanks, Lee. Nick? Uh, Nick Hamilton. Uh, I've been with Cisco about 17 years, but actually started, started supporting Purdue during the pandemic. So this is the first I've met David in person, along with a lot of people in a long time. We were talking about that. Um, but I help lead our higher education business um, in, in the US. Uh, and uh, we've been working, we have a long history with Purdue um, that dates back probably two decades from some of the research that I've done uh, and some of the folks that I've talked to uh, within, uh, within Cisco. So at Cisco, our purpose is to power an inclusive future for all. And we work to help our customers connect, secure, and automate in a cloud first world. So helping them with their digital agility. And uh, one of the reasons that our, uh, our business units and our leadership has been really attracted to the lab to life concept is there's a, forget who said it, but it's like the only difference between theory and practice is practice, right? You can, you can put uh, technology in place for the jobs to be done and the focus kind of the things we were talking about. And um, you know, we've, we've started, we've, we've initiated a, um, our business unit, our research group did, Cisco Research initiated a master research agreement, even though we have a long history of collaboration between Purdue and the PRF, uh, we formalized that. And um, we're starting to work on uh, one project around uh, 5G and Wi-Fi 6. Uh, which we can we can talk about as we go, um, but we're also looking really focused around and working with the, the departments across the campus around the student experience and um, around uh, supporting research overall and around uh, security. Um, so that uh, you know, Purdue I think is the, the number six uh, research university in the U.S. How can we we partner people and set an example um, uh, collaboratively? So it's great to be here. Thanks, Nick. Yeah. Um, just to, again, maybe some level setting questions for people that, um, you know, um, might not think about this every day like, like we do. So uh, do we live in a 5G world already? I mean, it, I mean, AT&T tells us we're 5G, right? Verizon tells us we're 5G. I don't know if my phone says we're 5G. Um, you know, but people are already talking about, um, you know, 6G and Wi-Fi 6 and this kind of stuff. So I get asked the question a lot about, really? Why, why are we focused on those things? But uh, would you agree with my sort of comment in the opening that we're just at the tip of the iceberg of the digital sort of uh, connectivity? And you know, to me, it's not linear. It's not a linear progression. I think what we're starting to see is the, 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 the asymptote start to occur, right? And the, and the parabola start to form that we're, the, the gap is starting to widen. And so, you know, we sit here at the epicenter of Discovery Park District, but we're also in a region surrounding us here in, in the greater Lafayette area, both through, you know, the collaborations we have with the city and our counties, and you can just go five miles away and you are in a, you know, a rural community that, you know, doesn't have some of this. So on the spectrum, are we still at the very beginning of this revolution? Are we in the middle of it? Uh, I, don't, I don't think anybody would think that we're at the, end of it, but I mean, just quickly down the line, Scott, where, where are we sort of based on what you think? Yeah, I, I, I see us very much in the beginning, right? It's uh, from our perspective, there is a lot of, uh, with, with airports and airlines, there's a lot of use cases that could be benefit from additional sensors, tracking of aircraft, uh, uh, tracking of vehicles, uh, cameras uh, are, are obvious ones, right? Uh, communication to, uh, you know, ground staff, that have always been cost prohibitive because you've had to overcome a you know, capital program to get the connectivity infrastructure in place. If that cost and complexity is driven down, now you've opened up you know, additional sensors to be managed. So, and you know, to answer your question, are we in a 5G world from my perspective? Not yet. Um, but the promise is, you know, uh, you know, I think beyond any single person's understanding or comprehend what that is. Yeah. Karen, you I agree? I fully agree. It's, if you check the news, we've sold a lot of 5G. Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, they bought a lot of 5G. They are implementing that. It has no meaning. I'm sorry, but it really has no meaning and, until people will start using that. The cat, people downloading cat videos faster? Mm, is that nah. You don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need 5G for that. Yeah. You may want to, pay, to play 3D or yeah. uh, whatever that. And we, we, the infrastructure is there. I'm, I'm saying that again, now we, start, we should start right. using that. Yeah. Lee? I mean, from, 
from a city's perspective, I think the opportunity that smart cities present is that you could watch you know, and process a hundred video feeds from traffic. And now with 5G, you can do a thousand of them. Um, are cities taking advantage of that opportunity and deploying new sensors that will be built on that to solve problems or create efficiency or connect more people? I mean, it's, it is an evolving framework. I think that smart cities started with fire and went through plumbing and sewers. And now we have indoor electricity and Rural electrification standardized that. I think we'll have this internet for all bill that's come through. I think we'll have a standard for connectivity. Um, will that will that mean that everyone utilizes fully a 5G environment? I, I don't know if that's the case or not. I can tell you that my phone, when it does flip to 5G, I, I only have about two hours of battery. And so we do have to solve some <laughs> right. problems still. Right. Right. Yeah, and I, I would agree that we're in the beginning of it. Um, and you can take a couple different slants on it, right? You can also take a digital equity s stance on it as well. Like I live in, I live in Maryland and one in four Marylanders don't have access to, uh, you know, broadband at home. Right. And there, there's, there's access, there's affordability. Um, but when you look at it from a smart city standpoint, and I think where we're going and I think it will, if, we stick around for the next talk too, right? They're starting to talk about 6G and beyond, like where are we going and what are some of the policy changes that, you know, we, we need to look at uh, for the outcome. So we're living in exciting times. I think of, I forget, it, it's future shock, I forget, but I forget who wrote the book, but right. it talks about uh, this, you know, in the seventies, like looking way ahead, you know, so. Yeah, with you. yeah. Um, so Nick, you kind of hinted at the conversation and one of the things that we like to try to do here in the Discovery Park District is, kind of be technology agnostic. Um, you know, we, we really want it to be driven by, you know, the capabilities, the technology, the business model, um, you know, Wi-Fi, uh, private networks, uh, you know, two or two, uh, you know, obviously we've lived in a Wi-Fi world, but Wi-Fi technology is getting much, much better. Um, private networks are now starting to come along, uh, and you know again it can be uh, g you know, regionalized and, and sort of you can sort of focal uh, focus that private network into a, a place like a building or a community like Discovery Park. Um, where do all these things? Is it, is it going to be one or the other? Or is it going to be a little bit of everything? How do you see that maybe evolving, emerging? Karen and I were talking about this prior, and I said, Karen, ask you to talk. I, I think they'll work together um, and continue to, to work together. So one of the things that uh, our um, two CTOs of our enterprise business unit and our service provider business unit, which I think together represent uh, probably about forty percent of the company's revenue. Um, they came up with this notion, which we're working with uh, Dr. Kim here on, right, of, um, you know, do we have, on a voice call, there's, some, there's a measurement for it, it's called a mean opinion score, right? It can measure the quality of a voice call. Do we have something that can look like that, look at that between how we're testing, you know, you know do you use 5G? Because again, we pull up our cell phones. I'm not on the Wi-Fi in here, but I think there are multiple SSIDs we probably can associate with, right? So. How, how do we work through that? Um, so I think they'll continue to work together and there are, it'll be use case driven. Right. Um, Karen, do you want to comment? I fully agree. And we did discuss that just before the panel. Each technology has its own advantages and each technology has its costs. Mm -hmm. And I believe each one, each use case will use the right technology right. for the use case. Yeah. What people, uh, again, maybe to provide a perspective here. So. Uh, it was last year, year before that all the PAL, uh, CBRS. Uh, so the government has been, you know, they're, obviously all this connectivity and, and, and technology run, runs on spectrum. You know, it's like the fuel for the, for the technology. Um, and, you know, AT&T has their spectrum, Verizon, Wi-Fi has different spectrums. But the government up until last year, uh, year before last, had basically held on to a significant portion of spectrum called C-band spectrum. Um, and um, they realized that they only needed about 5% of, of what they had reserved. Uh, so they uh, put out for auction on a countywide basis across the entire United States, an auction of this spectrum. And um, it got snapped up pretty quickly, uh, particularly a lot of the big uh, you know, global companies acquired it. But here in uh, West Lafayette, or uh, sorry, the Tippecanoe County, there are four uh, purchasers of that spectrum. And again, when you think about this connectivity, the hyperness of this connectivity, the need for more and more and more, the question becomes, you know, you need more spectrum. 
uh, to go to go with that in order to enable all of this to happen. So one of the unique things I think that's happening here in Discovery Park is this notion between private networks on one hand, Wi-Fi and some of the continued evolution. And obviously, it's it's you know it's good and it's going to get even better, but it's this you know create a playground where companies like both Cisco and Ericsson and others can come and understand what the real world implications of that are. I mean, just literally coming into a building like Convergence, at some point, you know, once you've validated on a Wi-Fi system, it will put you onto the Wi-Fi system. Well, the question is, with CBRS technology, what's the prioritization? Will it put you on a, on a CBRS uh, spectrum? Will it put you on a Wi-Fi? Uh, will it be dynamic based on signal strength? So these are all of real world innovation challenges that Ericsson, Cisco, <laughs> all the other companies are working with. But you don't figure that out in a lab uh, in Silicon Valley. You've got to come someplace where there are literally thousands of people and i.e. 50,000 students who love these things, right? And believe it or not, want to be guinea pigs for you know uh, the latest, greatest technology. So you can come to a place like this and really understand what the real world consequences and implications and what is the best use of a Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi 6 dynamic world versus a private network. Yeah, I think there's no best. There's the best for, for a specific case or for a specific solution. You do, you do need a better LTE or cellular connectivity right. here. My phone is important. Yeah, no, we... we yeah. <laughs> I need well, the Wi-Fi. Th 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 thank you for that, Karen. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I do need to connect to Wi-Fi. Right, right. <laughs> do you have a comment? I was just going to say, we do know it's going to be about experience. Right? Yeah. Experience, yeah. experience is what matters most. So how we work to and create that, um, that networked environment that creates a user experience and, and meets that, the use cases, it's got to... Okay, so, uh, Lee, I'm going to put you on the spot uh, when it comes to, as I, as I mentioned in the introduction, you know, we, being an engineer, fall in love with the technology, love talking about this, you know, some of these challenges, but at the end of the day, it's not technology for technology's sake, and you have really helped us, uh, US Ignite uh, being, being the you know, premier uh, organization helping us think about this. Talk about community engagement, you know, talk about how, and Nick alluded to it, you know, it's all going to be driven by use case and experience. Um, what is it about what you've seen, some of the things that we're doing uh, that are on target, off target? Um, I know you've been involved in a couple of our different projects in this area. Sure. Uh, thanks, David. I, th I think the one of the things that we're happiest with about um, the projects here at Discovery Park District is the opportunity to... Uh, put in place a framework that uh, is built on a trust. It's a trust framework. And so you had just said, you know, you have 55,000 students who don't mind being experimented on. This is a popular narrative that, that a lot of people just don't notice or don't mind that their life now belongs to the mind of a computer, maybe. Um, that we need to make sure that that community has an understanding of what interest the technology has for it, um, how the those who they entrust to make those good decisions are looking beyond kind of the daily, but into the larger economic, social, environmental needs of the place where those people exist. Um, you know, it's, it's similar to how do we control traffic or uh, of people or cars? How do we understand air quality or predict weather and severe weather events? Uh, how do we understand um, efficiency for a city operation, like the examples from scanning buses or roadways, those things represent the physical uh, infrastructure needs of a city, but as cities become the trusted entity for people and exert that influence over the technology providers and the vendors that occupy that space, we'll have to continue to look further at how the city can be responsible. I, there's a mayor from South Bend had said, you know, an interest is to control public safety, to improve public safety. Cities also have a responsibility to balance the need to protect the, the PII, the private individual's identification in that space and increase public safety at the same time. And when deploying a pilot, you often have a challenge because you've loaded a technology or a sensor network. You've increased observation of people. There are people, the SSIDs, the networks here know who everyone is in this room. We can, in theory, attach you to your buying habits, your spending habits, where you were this morning, how fast you're driving earlier today or afterwards. They could, in theory, hold that information for weeks or months if they wanted to. But the idea is that if we do those things, 
what framework should we put in place to regulate that space um, so that we're doing it responsibly so that in, people can control their digital identity and have agency over that piece. They can use it for research purposes if they so choose. You could monetize it if you so choose, but if without a, a good understanding of the current existing framework that we have, failed projects and successful projects, then we're kind of opening a Pandora's box that we don't know if we can close. And so th the thing that's greatest about having a brand new space with brand new residents is that yes, they wanna, they're want to? they open to being experimented with and on and participating in this larger experiment, but the, the guidelines that they put in place here with DPD is that we're putting trust at the front of that conversation. It's not the value of the technology itself, but it's what is the value of technology in reaching outcomes that community does want to find. There, there was an interesting example we had, you participated in a couple weeks ago, and, it, and again, to build on what Lee's saying, um, we held our first uh, town hall meeting uh, here uh, about three weeks ago. And um, because we're getting up to a critical mass of people that are now living in the, you know, the multifamily homes and the individual family homes. And, um, you know, there's, you know, close to you know, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 people now probably in the district. And, um, uh, you know, we it was our first meeting to bring these folks together. And it was just fascinating to describe, and we didn't get into digital identity, we didn't get into monetization of your, but that's where they took it independently. And again, I'm used to dealing with students. I'm used to going to Silicon Valley and listening to everybody talk about blockchain and all the, you know, the crypto kitties. And now you see, you know, non-fungible tokens. And now you see the NCA with name, image and likeness. So, you know, it's it's in the general public now. Three years ago, no one knew what NFT stood for. Right. Uh, but now now people do. And what was amazing to me is here you had a group of, you know, my generation of people, uh, our generation of people now living here. And that's what they wanted to talk about. And they wanted to say, well, how do I create my own digital identity? How do I use this tool that you guys in this infrastructure, in this environment, in this community? And it's an, and you, you talked about trust. And part of trust is you don't make it coercive. You don't make it mandatory. You know, you don't have to participate if you don't want to participate. But if there's an opportunity for people to participate in a trusted way, you know, that can be very exciting for people. And so for me to listen to, you know, a generation of, let's say, my age people talking about that just blew my mind because I'm used to listening to 18, 19, 20 year olds talk about it, not, you know, 30, 40, 50 year olds talk about it. So I think, I think we're really on to something because we've now positioned this as important as just the infrastructure and, you know, obviously the rollout of some of this innovation. Agree? Yes. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. So um, let me check. Um, any questions? We got about uh, 15 minutes. Uh, any questions from the audience uh, for our panel? Frank. Um, Dave, I know you, I was really excited to see you get the Ascension commitment to be, uh, the Ascension commitment to be a part of uh, the Purdue Research Park Extension uh, Discovery Park. Are there any other teasers you can give us on future commitments from large companies or exciting uh, developments like that you could share with us? We're um, just trying to think off the top of my head if we have anything sort of in the hopper, in the works um, that, um, Probably nothing like the Ascension deal. You know, these things take time. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're planning future expansion in the district. Um, you know, we have big plans for a hypersonic facility. Um, it all takes the money and the partners and everybody to come together. But out in our aerospace district, so on the other side of um, uh, 231, where the Saab, the new Saab manufacturing plant is going in there, and we've got um, the Zucro Labs. But we're planning to uh, make a big investment and commitment to hypersonics. Um, we know that some of our uh, adversaries in the geopolitical space can shoot things in the air that are faster than we can keep up with. Uh, Congress had a panel about you are those US. UFOs, and <laughs> they may or may not be UFOs. They they, they might be other things, uh, but uh, we have limited capabilities here in the United States to test at different you know high levels of of the speed of sound, Mach you know eight, nine, ten, um, and so 
we're, we're, we're really talking and focused on doing in that area. We're always looking for, you know, the next generation of technologies, obviously connectivity projects and programs. And we'd love for uh, all of our, uh, these companies to locate either a hub, a technology hub or innovation center uh, here on campus uh, or a manufacturing site if, if, you know, you need, need things made. So, but, but suffice to say, Frank, there's probably not anything specific we can tell you, but the thing about this is, it's a community, right? It's got now a hospital. It, it's gonna, you know, we're talking about things, everything from a school to, you know, senior care, housing to retail. You know, reta retail, unfortunately, is not coming fast enough, but that is really a, a function of people living in the district. And now that we sort of re are starting to reach a critical mass, I think you'll start to see retail uh, come into the district. That presents all kinds of uh, opportunities as well. Uh, so, you know, we're, uh, we're really trying to create a community that would look like any other community in America, any other city in America, because of the, the richness of opportunity to pursue innovation in a controlled, you know, uh, and, and good, safe way. Thank you. Good. Other, other uh, questions from the audience? Question? Getting your steps in. Hi, my name's Amy Glenn. I'm from the Office of Future Engineers here at Purdue. We recruit all the undergraduate students uh, into the College of Engineering. I'm just curious for those uh, companies that are coming to be part, part of Discovery Park District, um, what are the opportunities for undergraduate students to get uh, research, internships, or co-op opportunities there? We can go right down the line. I, I, I know what the answer is, but uh, Nick, you start. We'll start on this end. Yeah, so I... Uh I'll give you my, my, it's a passion of mine, because I started at Cisco as an intern um, in financial services in 2005. Um, so we have a number of programs. I'll give you my card, right? So um, but we do, um, uh, through our engineering, our, uh, through our business units, and then through our uh, kind of our business development and sales programs, we do a lot of recruiting from Purdue, whether it happens directly or indirectly. Um, and then the what other comment I'll make is in terms of like our investments in cities and in areas, um, uh, we are, you know, working closer with universities in, in general. So I was telling David last night, um, it was announced a couple of weeks ago, we made a, a big investment in Atlanta, uh, to build out an office co-located with Georgia Tech. Um, but I, I will say that historically we've, we've got dating back to our time, um, uh, with a serious team here, right, from a security standpoint, we, we, there's a lot of our business units and the recruiting ties into Purdue. So if you're not already tied in, I'd be happy to, to sponsor you into those folks. So, Lee? Yeah, a super cool story here. Um, we have, uh, through the partnership with the Purdue Research Foundation, in extending the opportunity to apply technology into the built environment, a, pl a place, uh, we worked with the city of West Lafayette to understand how to better leverage a, a network of connected infrastructure, these smart cameras that are along the main thoroughfare. How do we use those cameras and the data that comes off of them um, to improve public safety for vulnerable road users, bikers, right? Um, two competing teams um, made it into the finals, each receiving $5,000 to develop from a, into a proof of concept, into a prototype. Those prototypes were effectively judged, if you will, by um, representatives of these public sector companies. Uh, engineers, they had partner time with the engineers of the city. They worked with their professors, Dr. Brophy, Professor Brophy's here. Um, these kids, brilliant minds, were freshman engineering teams, uh, did present very, really impressive ideas and ways to improve road safety for bicyclists. And the use case was, you know, city itself has its own traffic patterns. Fall and spring have different traffic patterns, and then game day Saturdays have third sets of traffic patterns. You may even change road direction, right? So traffic directions. How do we maintain a consistent and safe environment for those who may be in a, a city that's three times the size as it was two days ago, right? So um, the, the teams are now developing into those deployed status and will be looking to deploy into the, into the camera environment over the next coming months. And so we've mentored and coached those teams through the process of being startups. These kids are 19 years old and they're building amazing opportunities, both to apply research from their brains, from classwork, into the real environment where they're thinking about startups and thinking about businesses 
and then they're much more likely to having worked with these these companies to understand the demands that engineers in the professional environment do face and the kind of solutions they can can create to influence their own environment. Karen? So I think Ericsson is working in, with Purdue in two levels. And I will give a preview for the next session of Professor Mong here uh, with Jan, which is a real Swedish <laughs> from our company, he will join virtually. And we have a laboratory in, uh, in the West Coast <clears throat> that uh, collaborates here and I'm, I'm not the last, the right person to describe the, the collaborations, but it's, the next session will be up on 6G, which, which is science fiction, but the science fiction that we will create in 10 years or 20, okay? So we have that already going on, uh, as well as I hope we will be able to announce very soon, maybe, on, a, on the test bed that we will create together with Purdue and, and uh, Sub here. And then it will be a test bed for, that projects can be offered in order to use both the infrastructure of 5G or private networks and SAB's uh, solutions to create viable commercial solutions uh, to use to, for us to make the vision life. Yeah, I've always wanted to do you know, the infamous mic drop. Uh, we're building fighter jets here the next generation trainers for the US Air Force with a joint project with Boeing. So you think about what a training aircraft has to be and what it isn't. So obviously it isn't designed for high survivability, but it has to outperform the world's jet fighter fleet that we can train against now and in the future. So talk about innovation with sensors, different mission types, um, improved manufacturing. So you, got, you have that thread. The thread that I'm involved with here is we're, we are providing, you know, some of our advanced systems that we are applying to the major airports, the Atlantis, the JFKs, LAXs of the world, we're applying here in an innovation center with advanced networks to solve problems, right? And uh, I, I, the session before, I think the, uh, the mayor, I forget his name, made a tremendous point. How do we value technology? How do we know we succeeded, right? From his standpoint, is how can I have more planes through an airport with less people? That's technology, right? Airports cannot build infrastructure to meet the future demand of air traffic. And we're gonna have an explosion because we've had this lull with COVID where we had more capacity than people. Now as people are reduced, now we're gonna have more planes than people to serve them. There's a gap that technology with its speed and efficiency can bring into. So you talk about a school of, of students who are gonna be future airport operations managers and managers here. Now to understand how t technology, what's the new thinking with technology to make airports more efficient, it's an exciting place and time to be. So I think there's tr you know, tremendous, uh, tremendous story here. I'll steal Mung's talking point because I use it all the time. Uh, Mung, as, as folks know, he's going to moderate the next panel, our uh, illustrious Dean of Engineering. Purdue trains more engineers than MIT, Cal Berkeley, and Stanford combined. Um, so every year we get how many total, I mean, I know the total number of students at Purdue, 50, but how many are in engineering? 16,000. So you get 16,000 of the world's smartest kids coming here. And we want to keep them here. You know, we don't want them. Why do they stay in San Francisco? Because they think that's where all the cool jobs are. Why do they go and stay in Boston you know, when they go to MIT? Because that's where they think all the cool jobs are. You know, sign me up to work on uh, the air, you know, the fighter jet of the future or to work in the hypersonic space to figure out how to, you know, make the fastest things in the world that our, you know, geopolitical enemies can't, you know, can't touch. Uh, you know, I want to be here. You know, I want to be here. I want to be an engineer coming to school here. I want to have the opportunities to work for with these kinds of companies and think about those kinds of problems, right? Um, and I can tell you the number one problem that all these companies, you know, I start with very simple, I start from a very simple place when I talk to companies like this, it's like, what's your biggest problem, right? What keeps you up at night? And talent, 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 talent are probably the first five answers that I get. Uh, so, you know, a place like Purdue that's turning out just world-class talent, particularly in the engineering space and the other schools as well, don't get me wrong, but, you know, we're a target-rich environment <laughs> for opportunities uh, and, and I hope our students recognize that, so.
Good. Any other questions? Um, Scott, I, I, so the Top Gun movie, uh, are they going to be flying a Saab uh, trainer uh, in the Top Gun movie that's coming out on Friday? Well, at least be training against it. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, just, or trying to avoid it. But, I mean, that's the intent, right? I mean, it's uh, to train that. It's, you know, to train fighters, but also to train fighting against it. You know, it, right. today you're going to pretend to be a MiG. Today, tomorrow you're going to pretend to be a Chinese X. Yeah. You know, um, and how do you, what's this vulnerabilities and et cetera. So it's exciting so, stuff. How, how, you know, we were thinking about, we were, you know, earlier this year, FAA and FCC got into a bit of a, you know, a spat because they didn't know what this 5G sure. technology that was going to cause interference in air traffic. And, you know, there's a big hubbub, uh, you know, and we were down the path a little bit to actually trying to gather some data because of how busy we are. And they reached a truce and sort of they agreed to agree not to do anything for six months that might be coming up uh, here pretty soon. It doesn't, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. But outside of FAA and controlled airspace, how are the rules for 3D mobility going to be written uh, in the future <laughs> with regard to, and maybe this is, I'm looking at Lee too, because you're in the policy area on some of this, but like, how do you decide what the rules of the road are when you're thinking about 3D mobility, not just oh. 2D mobility? Yeah, if, if I knew the answer, I'd be in Davos right now okay. instead of, instead of <laughs> no disrespect. Um, complex, very, just very complex. I, I don't have an answer for you other than the, you know, the issues are going to be complex. And, but I think a lot of it's going to be driven from the business model, right? So uh, we were saying before, somebody who wants to have an air mobility helicopter from downtown Manhattan to JFK, he's not going to want to wait, you know, half an hour in a, in a TSA line. To go through right so then how do i pre-secure you know a person from uh you know manhattan so you can go right to the air side of the airport how do i do that securely what's my airspace constraints what are the priorities well, how does this billing facilities uh complex uh and so i i, I don't have a answer for you other than it's a hard problem. And one thing I learned on one panel, and you'll appreciate this, when a person from MITRE was talking about a question, and instead of saying, I don't know the answer, the proper answer is saying, that poses a very interesting research question. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I'll turn that back to you. Okay. <laughs> back well, to your, it's, uh, it's, yeah. it, it's, it's, it's the type of thing that I know we're going to have to come up with some answers for if yeah, we want exactly. to try some pilots here of doing that. So really, you know, it'll be a, be a fun challenge to tackle. Yeah.